What is One Piece's greatest arc? Of course, this series is full of amazing, well-written, and diverse arcs with many quirky islands, introducing us to a plethora of unique and memorable characters. From Alabasta to Water 7, Annie's Lobby, and Wano, each arc serves to bring a unique perspective and a fresh flavor to the story to satisfy all different types of readers. But what is the single greatest arc this series has ever produced? If you're like me, only one arc comes to mind one arc that stands head and shoulders above the rest, having the best laughs and the worst cries, lives saved and lives lost, with epic entrances and introductions, unexpected alliances, unexpected betrayals, and everything in between. Marine Ford had it all. To many fans, Marine Ford is the pinnacle of this series and a monumental reason why we love it in the first place. But what makes Marine Ford so great? Why is it that virtually every reader and watcher was heavily impacted by this arc? Today I'm going to give my best attempt at answering this question as thoroughly and as accurately as I can by giving four simple yet crucial reasons from a writing standpoint on what makes this arc so special. Four things that Marine Ford did differently from virtually every other arc that made it a massive success. And so with that being said, let's begin. Marine Ford managed to surprise us constantly throughout because it broke the mold of what a One Piece arc should be. Though each arc is different, they all tend to follow somewhat of an organized pattern. Luffy and the Straw Hats enter an island for the first time. They meet an inhabitant of that island who they grow close with as the arc progresses. They enjoy themselves at first and have a good time, usually splitting up. And as the arc's tension builds, we learn about the darker side of the island and the struggles and oppression the citizens face through that one person Luffy grew close enough with to now consider a friend. We then see firsthand what the antagonist is capable of. More times than not, the marines will also show up acting as an independent third party. Luffy then understands the torment being caused by the antagonist vicariously through the struggle of his friend. Luffy gets fed up and challenges the antagonist. The Straw Hats fight the henchmen and Luffy defeats the main villain. They eat, they sleep, they party, they form a meaningful and lasting bond with the citizens, they run from the navy, and before you know it, they're off to the next island to repeat the cycle once again. If I were to ask you to guess which arc I was referring to based on that explanation alone, you'd be stuck guessing between almost every arc in the series. And that's not to say that One Piece arcs are generally repetitive or boring, because Oda does manage to make each arc stand out and feel special in its own unique way, all while sticking to this basic formula. But Marine Ford managed to take this formula, turn it upside down, left and right, and completely alter it as though it was a Rubik's Cube coming with an entirely different and strange formula, and not only managing to succeed in doing so, but thriving beyond any of our expectations. For one, in almost every other arc, the problems the antagonists bring never actually affect Luffy directly. It's never a personal issue for Luffy, and if he weren't at the right place at the right time, he wouldn't even know the problem existed. And it's not his responsibility either. Luffy's already made it perfectly clear that he doesn't want to be seen as a hero, because he doesn't consider himself one. And he's right, he's not. A hero is someone who does the right thing and helps people for no other reason than because it's the right thing to do. And Luffy doesn't care about any of that. Luffy cares about his friends. And it's only because he grows close with a citizen of that island who is directly affected by the actions of the antagonist and has no one else to turn to that Luffy takes action and brings down the villain. Think about Arlong Park for example. Luffy spent most of the arc not really doing anything and didn't seem at all interested in the problems the people of Kokoyashi village were dealing with. It was only when he saw Nami crying in hopelessness and broken down internally from what Arlong had done that Luffy decided to take action. Because Nami was his friend and even though she didn't see them as friends, Luffy had already considered her as such a long time ago. And so her struggles became his struggles. Her pain became his pain. And it's because of this that Luffy fights Arlong. Luffy took down Crocodile because of the hurt he caused Vivi. He fought Enel because of Konis and the others. Doflamingo because of Law and Rebecca. Kaido because of Kinemon and Momonosuke. It's never in Luffy's own self-interest that he fights and defeats these villains, but in the interest of those whom he considers his friends. And because he almost always leaves immediately, he rarely gets to see how much better the lives on those islands become because of his actions. He just knows that his friends who remain there will now be okay, and that's good enough for him. But with Marine Ford, this wasn't at all the case. Marine Ford was personal for Luffy. This was a problem that directly affected him. 
regardless of what island he was on at the time or whether he even became a pirate, just like it affected the Don, who hadn't even left their childhood home. There was no escaping or avoiding the immediate effects and consequences this would have on Luffy's own life. If Luffy chose to do nothing, sooner or later he would hear the news of his brother's death. He couldn't even focus on his own adventure the moment he found out Ace was captured. It was like everything went on pause to save Ace. And for what felt like the first time ever, Luffy truly needed to do this. Not for others, but for himself. And typically with other arcs, Luffy is generally the only one capable of getting the job done. Everyone is relying on him. It wasn't Koza nor Cobra who could remove Crocodile, nor was it Law or Kiros that could defeat Doflamingo. Yamato and the Scabbards could only hold Kaido off at best until Luffy arrived. Even with strong fighters on their side, at the end of the day when all else fails, everyone turned to Luffy. If he couldn't get the job done, nobody could. But with Marine Ford, it's Luffy who finds himself relying on others. Luffy was far from the only one capable of saving Ace and even further from being the strongest person fighting against the Navy. You had people like Whitebeard, Marco, Jimbe, Vista, Ivankov, Hancock, and even Ace, all either supporting Luffy or fighting for the same cause, all of whom were almost definitely stronger than him at the time. Countless times throughout the arc, Luffy is saved by one of these people. Vista saves him from Mihawk, Hancock saves him from Smoker, Whitebeard saves him from Kizaru, Ace saves him from Akainu, Marco saves him from Aokiji, and later on Akainu. Ivankov gave him the energy he needed to stand up and continue fighting, and Jinbei saved his life more times than I can even count. I honestly don't think anyone has saved Luffy more times throughout the entire story than Jinbei did in just this arc alone. Luffy was extremely dependent on others from the very beginning of this arc. It's because of Garp that he was able to reach Ace. It's because of Shanks that his life was spared. It's because of Law that he managed to escape. When I think of Luffy's state in this arc, one word comes to mind, helpless. As strong as Luffy was by this point in time, he was completely helpless and in constant need of saving. He was in a war titled the War of the Best, full of the strongest pirates and marines across the world facing off against each other. And Luffy was just one kid who wanted to save his brother. If Luffy was left alone for just a moment, it wasn't long before he needed saving. Time and again we saw just how weak Luffy was in the grand scheme of everything. This was a wake up call for Luffy that he hadn't had the chance to experience through other arcs. If he wasn't the strongest on those islands, he wasn't far behind the strongest. But in Marine Ford, he wasn't even close to it. Marine Ford was the first time in his pirating career that he felt so helpless. That he was forced to watch his world crumble and fall apart right in front of him and he was too weak to do anything about it. If we're being perfectly blunt, for the first time ever, Luffy failed. The circumstances of this arc were nothing new for the most part. Lives had been on the line before, lives of people Luffy cared about, but he always succeeded in saving them. Nico Robin in Annie's lobby immediately comes to mind when I think of those tense situations where Luffy was forced to step up to the plate and get the job done. And he did. But once again, this pattern shifted at Marine Fort, the one time where it mattered most. Where Luffy always succeeded in the past, every single time, this time, when it mattered most, when it wasn't for his Nakama and his friends, the one time it was for himself, it resulted in complete and utter failure. And it's because of this that he accepts Rayleigh's offer to train for two years and put a hold on his voyage. Marine Ford is the only arc in One Piece that was built up from the start of the pre-time skip. The arc itself begins in chapter 550, but I would argue it really begins with chapter 1, because everything from the very beginning was always leading up to Marine Ford. Aside from the other Straw Hats, almost every other character's story arc was all leading to the same destination, to an epic climax at Marine Ford. Typically, One Piece storytelling works with two types of plot, story arcs and story sagas. These two types of plot aren't mutually exclusive and usually are progressing at the same time. If I were to define these in basic terms, I guess a story arc would typically be one island, one villain, and one main objective Luffy needs to accomplish. For example, Ennis Lobby, where Ennis Lobby would be the island, Rob Lucci was the villain, and saving Robin was the objective. Or Alabasta, with Alabasta being the island, Crocodile the villain, and freeing the people from Crocodile's oppression was the objective but a story saga would be a collection of multiple story arcs, all with different minor plot points, villains and objectives, but sharing the same major plot, villain and overall objective. For example, the Alabasta Saga, 
In Little Garden, Luffy and the Straw Hats are on an island with two giants. The main villain is a man named Mr. Three, and Luffy's main objective throughout this arc is to free his friends, defeat Mr. Three, and help out the giants. Even though they aren't on the island of Alabasta or fighting directly with Crocodile or actively helping Vivi save her country in that moment, this arc, which is a part of the Alabasta saga as a whole, is building up toward that by gradually adding tension to the overall plot of the saga while focusing mainly on the minor plot of the arc itself. Mr. Three, the main villain of this arc, is a subordinate of Mr. Zero or otherwise known as Crocodile, the main villain of this saga. And as each arc passes, Vivi is bonding more and more with the Straw Hats that by the time they get to Alabasta, the trust and friendship is deeply established. This arc did its job perfectly as a smaller and earlier arc within a larger saga, and that job is simply to build tension toward the saga climax. And the same can be said for Reverse Mountain, Whiskey Peak, and Drum Island. All of these arcs built toward Alabasta, and with each arc we learned more and more about Crocodile, either through the arc villain being a direct subordinate, or simply through gaining more information about him, like his warlord status and former bounty, and what kind of a man Crocodile was. The main villain of Punk Hazard was Caesar. The overall plot was centered around Law and Luffy forming an alliance, as well as Smile Fruits and destroying Caesar's lab, but this was all a build up to Dress Rosa. Monet, Virgo, and Caesar, all of whom were the primary antagonists of the Punk Hazard arc, all worked for Doflamingo, the primary antagonist of the Dressrosa saga. Law and Luffy forming an alliance was to set up their teamwork that played a huge role in taking down Doflamingo. Law eliminating Virgo and destroying the laboratory, all while on a live call with Doflamingo, was to massively build up tension between Doflamingo and Law. I remember experiencing Punk Hazard for the first time, and by the time the arc was over, all I could think was, what is gonna happen to Luffy and Law when Doflamingo finally gets to them? And that's exactly what a build up arc is supposed to do. Although Caesar was the arc's primary villain, him being a subordinate to Dofi, and Dofi getting more and more angry as the arc progresses, was all essentially to build up toward Doflamingo. Destroying the Smile Factory may have been the immediate objective of the arc, but that was all to get to Doflamingo so Luffy and Law could eventually take him down. Dressrosa was as great as it was because Oda took the necessary steps to build up the tension of the arc by using the arc prior. It's because of Punk Hazard's build up to Dressrosa that Dressrosa succeeded. And although Marine Ford was its own climax arc to the overall Summit War saga, which included Saba Odi, Amazon Lily, Impel Down, Marine Ford, and the post war arc, Marine Ford was not just the climax arc of the Summit War saga, but of the entirety of pre timeskip. The way I like to look at it, the Alabasta arc is to the Alabasta saga what Marine Ford is to the pre timeskip. Because the build up to Marine Ford didn't start with Saba Odi. It started with everything. Sure, tensions did skyrocket to a new level once Luffy found out about Ace's capture, which kicked off the saga. But why was Ace captured? Why did Blackbeard and Ace fight? And why was Whitebeard preparing for war against Navy headquarters? All of these plot points were slowly progressing in the background since the story itself began. The same way that Little Garden and Punk Hazard had their own plot points, but were actively developing the plot of Alabasta and Dressrosa respectively in the background, throughout all of the pre time skip, with each arc, each island, and each scene we get of the world outside of Luffy's perspective, with Blackbeard murdering Thatch, Lafitte nominating Blackbeard as a warlord candidate, Shanks sending Rockstar to Whitebeard and later on going himself, Kuma sending the Straw Hats to different islands, seeing the true power of a Navy Admiral in Long Wing Longland, learning even more about them with Kizaru and Sabaody, learning Garp's connection to Luffy in post Ennis Lobby, and that Kobe had been training under Garp. All of this was happening quietly in the background, bit by bit, the entire time. It was as early as chapter 100 in Logtown that we met Dragon, and later in chapter 432, we find out he's Luffy's father. All of which was the reason for Akainu's merciless pursuit of Luffy all throughout the war. It was as early as chapter 69 that we first heard of Jinbei and the concept of warlords, both of which played a pivotal role in Marine Ford. We first learn about Ace and Blackbeard all the way back in Drum Island. We first hear about the great pirate Whitebeard and the Whitebeard pirates in Alabasta. Oda was preparing all of these smaller plot points to eventually all come together in an epic climax to the first half of the series. 
all while we had no clue, as we were simply following the minor plots from arc to arc and doing our best to keep track of these smaller details through the slow world building that turned out to be the most important plot points, and led to the final and most important arc of the first half of the series. Everything that was happening was building up to the summit war. And by the time we get to the war, nearly every character involved was able to have a strong impact on us readers because of the buildup each character had at one point or another throughout the first half of the series that was leading up to their role at Marine Ford. Long Ring Longland was the first arc of the Water 7 saga, and it's here that we first met Aokiji and begin to see the relationship between Aokiji and Robin, and Aokiji hints to the straw hats that Robin will eventually leave them like she does everyone else. Then as we get to the Water 7 arc, we start to understand more and more of what Aokiji was talking about. And as we complete Ennis Lobby and finally reach the post Ennis Lobby arc, everything comes full circle. As Aokiji and Robin have yet another conversation, this time Aokiji realizes he was wrong in his estimation of Robin. This time she didn't run away like he expected because she had finally found a home. And it's because of this that Aokiji decides to leave her to live her life in peace. This was the primary plot of the Water 7 saga. It was the very first thing to open up the saga in Long Ring Longland, and four arcs later, it was the very last thing to close it out. As we get that understanding that Robin finally has people she can trust, that even if she runs away, they will always be there to fight alongside her and face her enemies as their own. Robin went from a woman who couldn't trust others and who couldn't be trusted herself, to finally putting her full trust in the Straw Hats, and knowing that she had their trust as well. She was finally and completely, without any doubt, a straw hat. And with that, the saga had perfectly wrapped up. And this is what Marine Ford managed to do with all of the major plot points that had been growing all throughout the first half of the series. It may not have permanently concluded everything, otherwise the series itself would be over, but what it did do is temporarily but perfectly conclude all of the major plot points that had been progressing since the very beginning. Was Whitebeard still going after the Navy? No, because Whitebeard was dead. Was Shanks still trying to stop an inevitable meeting between Blackbeard and Ace? No, he had failed and Ace was now dead. Was Luffy still trying to save his brother? No, because once again, Ace was dead. No longer was Ace on the hunt for Blackbeard. No longer was Blackbeard looking to capture Luffy to gain warlord status. By capturing Ace, he had already accomplished this, and we now knew his plan all along was to obtain Whitebeard's devil fruit on top of his own. But even though these plot points were wrapped up for the time being, they left a perfect opening for the second half of the series to pick up on them and take them to greater heights. Whitebeard was dead, but his territory and position as an emperor now belonged to Blackbeard. Shanks may have stopped Blackbeard temporarily, but he was now growing even stronger and would eventually make his move again and this time, someone would have to stop him for good. Luffy may not have been able to save his brother, but he grew immensely from this loss and learned that he needed to become much stronger if he wanted to protect the people he loved. Akainu may not have killed Luffy, but he's now the fleet admiral of a new and stronger than ever navy headquarters, and is now even more determined to stop the new age of piracy at all costs. If anything, Marine Ford felt like an alternate end to One Piece, one where the villain wins and the hero loses. Because of how well it managed to bring every character and connect every plot point together in a way that I've only ever seen final arcs of other series do, somehow Oda manages to do this just halfway through the series. It was a perfect ending and at the same time a perfect beginning. Marine Ford served as a definitive divide between the two halves of the series, putting the plot on hold while laying the groundwork for it to pick up right where it left off later on. Luffy may not have been Pirate King, Blackbeard and the Navy were yet to be taken down, but Marine Ford wrapped everything up so flawlessly that the only option left was for both Luffy and readers to take a break and take in everything that had just happened. From chapter 1 all the way to the end of the first half of One Piece. And really quickly, I want to mention that a whopping 95% of you who watch these videos aren't subscribed. So if you guys are enjoying this, then please be sure to subscribe for more content just like this. Monkey D. Luffy is the protagonist of One Piece. And just like with any work of fiction, a story will always center around its main character. After all, this is Luffy's journey that we are all following. So it should come as no surprise to any of us that there has never been a single arc where Luffy wasn't the main focus and center of attention. Yes, we could point to the reverie, 
but spanning a mere 6 manga chapters and 12 anime episodes, I find it hard to label The Reverie as an arc, or at the very least its own standalone arc. But I would make the argument that with Marine Ford, Luffy wasn't the main or only focus. Let's make one thing perfectly clear however, of course Luffy was still a major focus in the arc, and if we were to zoom out and look at the bigger picture of Marine Ford when connected to the story as a whole, then yes, there is no doubt Marine Ford was absolutely about Luffy and what it did for his dream as well as developing his will, maturity, and fortitude. But if we zoom in and take the Marine Ford arc alone, just the war by itself, Marine Ford was just as much about Ace and Whitebeard as it was about Luffy. I'm sure if I were to reread the arc and measure each character's screen time, Luffy would undoubtedly come out on top. And that's expected because we're following the story through his perspective, and the Summit Wars saga was no exception to that. But which characters did Oda really focus on with this arc? Which characters did we really get to see the most of? Not necessarily in terms of screen time, but by understanding their character with as much clarity as we could, through internal dialogue, their self-doubts, their struggles and vulnerabilities, their justifications for their actions, the things they loved and what mattered most to them, and their reasons for living and setting out to see. And by this criteria, two characters come to mind, Ace and Whitebeard. A lot of what I'm going to talk about next is factoring in my own personal feelings toward the arc and how I perceive the arc through my own understanding. Subjectivity will be the name of the game here. Some of you may agree or disagree with this next part, but at the very least, I hope I can offer you a different perspective. One of the biggest reasons why One Piece is my favorite work of fiction ever is because it's such a breath of fresh air in the sense that it manages to make the One Piece world feel like a real world. Minus things like Devil Fruits, Zombies, and the extremely bizarre character designs of course. But what One Piece manages to do to an extent that I've yet to see anywhere else is its world building. Since the beginning, Oda wrote the story in a way where it was about Luffy, but at the same time it wasn't. With so many characters, island, and organizations, no matter what Luffy was up to, there were always a handful of events taking place somewhere else, far away with characters that we knew about. Take chapter 233 for example. While Luffy was beating Bellamy and stealing back Mont Blanc Cricket's treasure, Buggy and Ace had met up. The five elders were discussing who should fill in for Crocodile as a warlord. Sengoku and the warlords were getting together to discuss political matters. Rockstar was meeting with Whitebeard on behalf of Shanks. And the Blackbeard pirates were preparing to capture Luffy. All of these events were happening simultaneously at various locations with known characters and each of these events were progressing the story equally. The world building is so vast with One Piece that in order to constantly move the story forward, Oda has to progress events across the globe by using countless other characters besides Luffy. And when you introduce and build characters in such a way, with only fleeting moments here and there for us to capture as much about these characters as we can, eventually there must come a time where all of these characters can have their own moments to shine in order for us to continue to care about them and for them to have an impact on the story as a whole. Aside from the main antagonists of arcs like Crocodile and Nell and Luchi who had their moments already, the rest of the supporting cast still needed the same. And when most of them are neither villains to have an arc solely dedicated to themselves, nor straw hats to always have some level of focus on them, it becomes almost impossible to find time to fulfill all of these side characters and do them justice. And this is what Marine Ford succeeded in doing. By putting Luffy's adventure on hold and removing the straw hats from the picture entirely, Oda managed to take one arc and dedicate it completely to developing all of these supporting characters that up until that point, we had only gotten glimpses of at the most. And this wasn't just happening in Marine Ford, but the Summit War saga as a whole was dedicated to this theme. The first arc that we got after the Straw Hats are disbanded was Amazon Lily, and Amazon Lily gave us a lot of character revelation with Boa Hancock. In the following arc, Impel Down, we get even greater character development with Bon Clay. But even though the whole saga centered around this theme, Amazon Lily and Impel Down were like the appetizers, and Marine Ford was the buffet. The same way we got character revelation with Hancock and Amazon Lily, and the same way we got character development with Bon Clay and Impel Down. Marine Ford gave us a plethora of both of these with many more characters. We learned about Whitebeard, Jinbei, and Akainu, characters we previously knew little to nothing about. We saw development with Garp, Kobe, and Crocodile, characters who we already knew but were now seeing a new depth to them that we hadn't before. 
order replaced what would have normally been time dedicated to the Straw Hats with a plethora of supporting characters who we were somewhat familiar with before this, but had only touched on briefly when it came to their depth. For the sake of not making this video too long, and to keep the analysis centered around the Marine Fort arc rather than the characters themselves, I won't be discussing too deeply the development Marine Fort did for so many supporting characters, as a lot of those characters would need a separate video dedicated just to them in order to do them justice. But what I will do is touch briefly on one smaller example. However, if this video does receive a lot of love, I will do a full Marine 4 chapter analysis series with each video dedicated to one character and what Marine 4 did for their character arc. So if you guys would like to see that, then thumbs up the video and let me know down in the comments. Jinbei is perhaps the most honorable and morally sound character in the series. And although he was introduced in Impel Down, just right before the Marine Ford arc, by the end of the war, we have a full picture of what kind of a person Jinbei is. Jinbei is someone who doesn't take things like honor and justice lightly, and he will pretty much always do the right thing regardless of the consequences. But he also has his own code and he doesn't let anyone break it. Although he has a lot of respect for Ace and is willing to do whatever it takes to prevent his execution, he turns down Ace's request for him to protect Luffy, as he would only do such a thing for someone he respects and admires. But as the arc unfolds and Jinbei fights closely alongside Luffy, he sees time and again the quality of Luffy's character, Luffy's will, and how far he is willing to go to save his brother. And eventually this merits Jinbei's respect and by the end of the arc, he's gladly willing to sacrifice his own life to protect Luffy. And Jinbei explicitly states this wasn't due to Ace's request, nor the respect he had for Ace simply transferring over to Luffy. But Luffy earned Jinbei's respect on his own and proved worthy of protecting. Jinbei went from being totally impartial to Luffy, to saving his life countless times and even taking a nearly fatal blow from Akainu in exchange for Luffy, simply from observing Luffy's character and how that inspired Jinbei, eventually leading to him becoming a straw hat pirate and having Luffy as his captain. And Jinbei is a smaller example of the growth we see from supporting characters throughout this arc that we wouldn't otherwise see if the straw hats were involved. And this was honestly a very refreshing experience. Luffy still had support, he still had a crew. It was just new faces and new names. It may not have been Usopp there to provide goofy moments and comedic relief. Instead, it was Buggy. Zoro wasn't there to keep Luffy level-headed and be ready to sacrifice his own life at any moment to protect his captain, but Jinbei was. We didn't get a classic Mr. Prince moment with Sanji, coming in clutch when it matters most and drastically changing the landscape of the battle but Crocodile and Mr. 3 were as clutch as ever. Frankie's typical freakiness and over-the-top persona were absent, but a new persona was born with Ivankov. These otherwise lesser important or non-existent characters prior to this saga were now able to fill the roles of the main stars that readers grew so familiar with over hundreds and hundreds of chapters. And I can honestly say that I've never in my lifetime seen another series that was able to remove its entire supporting cast of characters built around the protagonist and swap them with mostly brand new characters or characters with far less time invested in them than the Straw Hats had and not only have that arc succeed, but have it be statistically the most successful point in your story without question. And this is a testimony to how well Oda creates characters no matter how big or small their role may be. And in the same way, these secondary characters flawlessly filled in the roles of support generally reserved for the Straw Hats, the primary role and the main focus of this arc was split between Whitebeard, Ace, and Luffy. Just as much as Marine Ford was about the bond between two brothers, it was also about the bond between father and son. The emotions, revelations, backstories, and bonds we got to see from both Whitebeard and Ace in this arc was just as important as everything we saw with Luffy. When you think about it, we never really knew much about Whitebeard before Marine Ford. You could count on one hand the number of scenes he'd been in, or the number of times his name was even mentioned prior to this saga. We knew that he was a seemingly menacing and very powerful pirate. We knew that he was the world's strongest man and was an equal to Roger. And we saw the smallest bit of his personality during his meeting with Shanks. But aside from these basic things that we knew about Whitebeard, his character was practically a blank canvas coming into Marine Fort. And of course Whitebeard died later in that same arc. And yet so many fans of this series love Whitebeard and so many readers say he is their favorite character in the entire series. Not because of his strength, not for his amazing mustache, but purely due to his character. 
What this single arc did for Whitebeard's character is like nothing I have ever seen before. To come into an arc with almost zero character background, with readers virtually knowing nothing about him, and 31 chapters later capturing the hearts of readers across the globe, that even to this day, 14 years later when he appears for just a small moment in a flashback, we all smile just knowing we get to see Whitebeard again. Some of you might be thinking, well what about Odin or Rosinante? Wouldn't this be the case for them as well? But with Odin and Rosinante, these were flashback characters, who in order to fully focus on, we had to completely stray away from Luffy and the current timeline and go into the past. It's a lot easier to be put in a primary role and succeed when you're given your own space. They were neither in the same place nor timeline as Luffy and Luffy had no involvement in their flashbacks. But Whitebeard was right next to Luffy, not only in the same place at the same time, but actively working towards the same goal. He was competing with the main character of a series 550 chapters in as someone who began the arc practically a stranger to readers and was permanently leaving 30 chapters later and was supposed to leave a strong enough impact on all of us that would last as long as this series itself. Whitebeard was put in an impossible position for a character to succeed, and yet he did. Whitebeard is by no means my favorite character, but he's by far the character I appreciate the most because of how well Oda handled his writing. I even made a separate video dedicated to Whitebeard and why I believe he's One Piece's best written character, and I'll leave a link to that video down below if you're interested. This is the magic Oda was able to create with Marine Ford. Marine Ford was a war mainly through Luffy's perspective, but not mainly about Luffy. It was also about Ace and Whitebeard, Garp and Kobe, Blackbeard and Jimbe. Some of the best character moments in the entire series come from this arc and aren't even from Luffy or any of the Straw Hats. There are characters in this arc that received better character moments and more spotlight than some Straw Hats were ever given. And these are characters who mostly have nothing to do with Luffy's journey, nor his dream. Whether the focus was on Whitebeard's poor health, or Garp's internal struggle, or Ace's confliction between wanting to live or die, these character moments made each of them feel like the protagonist of this arc in their own way. Not through the quantity of screen time, but through the sheer quality of depth. And that's credited to Oda's ability to focus on characters so well and give everyone their time to shine. One Piece manages to make its supporting characters so likable and interesting that we wanted to see more of them even at the expense of the Straw Hats if just for a little bit. I want you guys to stop for a second and think about some of your favorite characters outside of the main crew. Chances are most of these characters got their best character moments, developments, and screen time from Marine Ford. And that's the gift this arc gave us to split the supporting roles between so many new and older characters that were never given those roles before, and for Luffy to share the spotlight with not one, but two characters who barely got any screen time prior to this arc, and have them leave a lasting impact on us that will remain even far after their deaths. I doubt we will ever see another arc capable of pulling this off again. And speaking of death, that takes us to our final topic of discussion. One Piece is a series that, to put it lightly, handles death with a lot of controversy. We all remember the incidents with Pell in Alabasta, Pound in Whole Cake Island, and most recently Kinemon and the Scabbards in Wano. I will never forget the initial feeling I had reading chapter 1000 and the moment between Luffy and Kinemon. Fake out deaths in One Piece have gotten so bad that it's practically become a running gag at this point with how many Oda can squeeze into a single arc. So much so that it hinders real death scenes where the character really does die, but readers don't actually believe it. Many of us didn't believe Pedro had died until years had passed, and the Yonko saga came to an end without Pedro's return. And by then, it was too late. The anticipated effect of his death had failed. No one believed it when it happened, and by the time they did believe it, it was too late to care. Because readers trust patterns, we trust consistency, and unfortunately, one of Oda's biggest flaws is in how he uses fake out death scenes to rob emotions from readers, just to then go back on his commitment. Like a snake oil salesman who sells fraudulent goods but makes you believe it's something more than it is, in order to get a higher rate of currency out of you. And for the record guys, I am not calling Oda a snake oil salesman. I have nothing but respect for Oda as a mangaka. This is in no way throwing shade on Oda, 
but just to paint a picture for you guys to get a better idea of what I mean. The reader is the customer and their emotions are the currency. If you want currency from your customer, then you should offer them something of equal value, something worth what they are giving you in return. And unfortunately, this typically wasn't what we get with One Piece, but with Marine Ford, we did. I don't know of any other arc that handled death as well as Marine Ford. And I'm not just talking about death scenes, but the concept of death as a whole. Usually fake out deaths happen with characters who we care about, but not nearly to the extent we care about our favorite characters. Pell and Kinemon typically can't draw out the level of emotion from readers that Luffy or Jinbei could. And this is part of the reason Oda has to go to such extreme lengths with these characters to get a strong level of emotion from his readers. But in Marine Ford, instead of drawing out our emotions through faking a smaller character's death, this time, Oda pulled at readers' heartstrings by teasing the deaths of major characters without needing to fake anything. In chapter 578, Jinbei attempts to escape with Luffy while Akainu is in heavy pursuit. As Jinbei is running, Akainu lands a lethal hit that goes through Jinbei and penetrates Luffy as well. Jinbei lands on the ground, coughing out blood, and apologizes to Luffy for having failed to protect him. And he basically goes into primal instinct mode to try to protect Luffy with whatever life he still has left, as Akainu approaches him, ready to finish the job. I was never sold on a fake death more than I was here with Jinbei. And Oda hadn't even given him an actual death scene. Technically, this wasn't even a fake death, just raw, believable storytelling at its finest. But what made this scene so real and why did Jinbei really seem like a goner here? Well firstly, this was a war and in war, people die. Jinbei was someone who Oda hadn't invested too much time in by this point. He was only introduced in the arc prior and he came into Marine Ford with one objective, to save Ace. Between the Whitebeard Alliance, the Warlords, and the Navy, this was meant to be a gathering of the strongest pirates and marines across the world. And aside from the top guys, we see just how terrified the rest become once the war had started. War is not something you can really prepare yourself for. Only war prepares you for war. And once the battle starts and everywhere you look, death and destruction is surrounding you from every angle, bodies of friends and foe dropping like flies, the reality of what you signed up for starts to kick in. Death wasn't taken lightly in this arc, so much so that Kobe's entire character arc through Marine Ford was dedicated to displaying the tragic effects war has, not only on all of its participants, but their families as well. There are no winners in war. Throughout the arc, we see a strong emphasis on the consequences of lost life, not just in losing your life, but even just a portion of lifespan as well, as we see through dialogue between Ivankov and Luffy in chapter 568. When Squirt wants to make amends for stabbing Whitebeard, he tries to go on a suicide mission to give the rest of the Alliance an opening to escape. He's made the decision to sacrifice himself to help his comrades, and at first glance it appears he's at peace with this decision. But then Whitebeard comes in, he stops the ship and explains to Squirt the pain of a parent having to bury their child, and Squirt comes to his senses. This was an act of raw emotion and adrenaline due to the guilt he felt for stabbing Whitebeard. And desperately wanting to atone for his actions, this was the only way he knew how. But he wasn't really prepared for death. He couldn't truly understand the consequences of that decision. There may have been a few characters who truly were ready to die in order to save Ace, but only two people came to the war, not just ready and with a clear understanding of what that meant, but these two men came in fully expecting to die. They stepped into Marine Ford without any plans of leaving in the first place. If they could save Ace and help their friends escape, whether they lived or died in the process was completely irrelevant. That would already be a perfect victory in their eyes. Whitebeard and Jinbei were the only two people truly at peace with death. Even Ace, who had plenty of time to ponder over his execution and seemed the most at peace with it, hadn't truly accepted his fate. And once he sees the vast number of people who love him and value his life, he breaks down in emotion with a discovery that now more than ever, he wants to live. But Jinbei was fully prepared and at peace with dying. Akainu was the central antagonist of this arc, and just like Jinbei, he too was a newly introduced character at the time, and Oda wanted to make a really strong first impression with him. Not only did we see just how strong or menacing he was, even compared to the other admirals, but most of all, Akainu had already done the ultimate deed. He had already taken a life in this war. And not just any life, 
but Ace's life, the one that needed to be protected no matter what, the sole reason for this war in the first place. And up until this point, every lethal hit Akainu dealt to anybody, one way or another, resulted in their death. He punched through Ace, and Ace was dead. He punched through Whitebeard, and even though he wasn't the one to kill him, the wounds he inflicted played a major role in Whitebeard's death. And now this same man, built up with as much ammunition as possible, to be as threatening and legit of an antagonist as can be, with a 100% kill rate, hits the one of two people truly prepared to die who was still alive, who had just made a vow to himself to protect Luffy at all costs. And not only does Akainu punch him, but he uses the same attack in exactly the same spot and same way that he used to kill Ace. A clean strike from the back, through the torso and out the other side on someone putting their body in between him and Luffy. Ace dies and just two chapters later, Whitebeard dies and only another two chapters later, we find ourselves in the same predicament, only this time, it's Jinbei's turn. A character who truly did feel expendable at the time, especially fresh off the deaths of Whitebeard and Ace. Two characters who were far more significant to the plot. This was what made the moment feel so real as Akainu walks toward Jinbei. Oda had already proved Akainu was a certified killer. He had already proved that major characters could drop dead at any moment, one after another. And he had constantly put emphasis throughout the arc on how seriously Jinbei really was prepared to die. All the pieces were in place for Jinbei to be victim number three. And only now, when readers are on the edge of their seats, when Oda doesn't need to sell any of us on the idea this could really happen, just when he has all of us thinking he's gonna pull the trigger, Jinbei is spared. This is some of Oda's best writing. Not only does he use all of the buildup throughout the arc to draw the maximum amount of emotion from his audience in this moment, but this also shows us how well Oda capitalizes on Ace and Whitebeard's death. Because not only did their deaths bring out the highest level of emotion from readers for their own scenes, but by using the legitimacy of their deaths, Oda can now capitalize on other near-death moments with other characters and bring readers to an emotional peak that otherwise wouldn't be reached. It's only because of Ace and Whitebeard's deaths that this scene with Jinbei worked so well. Should Jinbei have died? Probably. Was he ever implied to be dead? No. Was his reason for surviving believable? Absolutely. Even when a character wasn't actually going to die, Oda didn't need to fake anything. He didn't need to pretend they were dead to get the emotional currency he needed from readers. His product was already legitimized, and we knew it, so we bought it all without a second thought. This allowed Oda to sell us on anything, at any moment while being as honest and transparent as possible. Something that I've yet to see him achieve with any other arc. So now let's look at the actual deaths of Ace and Whitebeard. I won't go into what their deaths represented for their characters, because like I said earlier, I intend to make separate videos for those in the near future. But let's discuss what their deaths represented for the general concept of death as a whole. Both Ace's and Whitebeard's deaths represented the reality of war, but in different ways. Ace's death showed us the suddenness at which death can happen. We spent the entire arc trying to save him when he seemed so far away from saving. And now, just when he was freed, when everything is going well, Ace dies in such a tragic and gruesome way. Ace lived his whole life with courage, never running from anyone no matter the consequences. We see this in detail through the ASL flashback, and we also get the reasons behind it there as well. But although it may have worked out for him up until that point, eventually this was bound to happen. If you never run away from anyone who ever poses a threat to you or challenges you, then sooner or later you're going to die. Shanks affirms this at their funeral when he states that part of becoming a man is knowing when to accept defeat. This was one trait Ace lacked as a person and death caught up to him because of it. What death represented in Ace's case was the reality of the consequences of each decision that you make. Everyone had worked so hard to free him, and many had died in the process, and now he was finally free and escaping with his loved ones. Whitebeard would be the final casualty of this war, something he had already accepted long before arriving. Everyone on his side of the war was for the most part content with this outcome. They knew saving Ace was going to come with consequences, and the casualties were the consequences. But at least now, they had Ace, what all of the sacrifice was initially for. 
and one decision by Ace took him and everyone else from this moment of victory to complete and utter loss in every imaginable way. Now Ace was dead, and every casualty on their side was in vain. They had lost the war, they had lost their friends, and now they had lost Ace. Because of how he lived his life, never running no matter the circumstances, Ace was now dead before anyone could even process what had just happened. One chapter begins with Ace ready to leave Marine Ford alive and well, and by the next chapter his cold and lifeless body is laid flat on the floor in front of his brother. This is the reality of war and this is the potential consequences of the decisions you make in war. That everything can be lost in a split second, because tragedy often strikes when you least expect it. But the greatest part about Ace's death from a writing standpoint isn't with the death itself, but with what Oda did after. It was only after Ace was killed that we had an entire arc dedicated to him and fully understood his character, redeeming his qualities and justifying his previous actions. We experienced the whole ASL flashback knowing very well this was going to be the last time we saw Ace. It made us cherish every moment and appreciate every panel Ace had from that point on. Because we knew once the flashback was over, so was the character of Portugas D. Ace. And somehow that made his death far more depressing than it already was. Whitebeard's death showed us that even the biggest heroes can fail in the most crucial moments. That sometimes you work really hard towards something that means everything to you and still fail in the end. And you're forced to come to peace with it however you can. Failure was a heavy theme of this arc. And in no one's case was it a bigger theme than with Whitebeard. All he wanted was to save Ace and help his sons escape unharmed. He knew there was no place for him in this new generation that was on the horizon. Whitebeard had lived a long and grand life and dying here was going to be his peace at the end of it all. But his death came with a twist and a lesson to be taken. No matter how much you love your children, you can't always guide them to the right decisions. Whitebeard was wise enough to know that going after Blackbeard was bad news, but he couldn't stop Ace from trying. And now with Ace facing execution, Whitebeard feels that he let his son down. If one of his sons fail, if they make a mistake, it's because he wasn't there to guide them. That's Whitebeard's mentality as a father. We saw it with Squirt, and now we see it with Ace. In his eyes, he had failed to protect Ace from landing in this position, and now the very least he could do is exchange his own life for his sons who still had a bright future ahead. But again, no matter how much you love your child, you cannot protect them from their own decisions. And this time, right in front of Whitebeard, Ace's decision proved fatal. Just a moment ago, Whitebeard was ready to die knowing Ace and everyone else could make it out safely. But now he's forced to watch Ace die, knowing that yet again he failed to be there for him, to protect him from his own reckless decisions. And now Whitebeard was forced to make whatever peace he could with his own death. In what was supposed to be a death of success, killing the enemy, saving his family, and bringing down Marine Ford with him, was now a death of failure. Ace was gone, the enemy wasn't, and all he could do was give one final apology to his sons. Marine Ford was a breath of fresh air that we couldn't even take in because it had us holding our breaths from start to finish. This truly was Oda's finest work. With over a decade of buildup through precise and patient world building and a new formula that succeeded masterfully, giving us fresh new characters stepping into the spotlight and not only succeeding but thriving unapologetically. Characters introduced that would go on to be some of the best written and most popular characters of this series and a perspective on death unlike anything I've seen before, not just from One Piece but anywhere. By approaching this arc with a totally unique writing tactic, Oda managed to create what would be the most successful point in One Piece to date, shattering sales records and launching One Piece into global popularity. And nearly 15 years later, it's no surprise that Marine Ford is still the most talked about arc from readers and watchers around the world, as perhaps Oda's magnum opus and what many would deem the greatest arc this magnificent, decades long series has ever given us. I want to thank each and every one of you for watching, and a special thanks if you made it to the end. If you did enjoy this video and would like to see a deeper dive into each character at Marine Ford, be sure to like the video and let me know down in the comments.